Prince Andrew, although having said that, to be honest, this has been rumbling on now for years. And it started off with, you know, suspicions and gossip, and it's now turned into you know, a foundation of illegality, of, of abuse, um, that his lawyers are, are, are trying to prevent going much further. But interestingly, this morning, we, we've got um, the establishment voice of Christina Dick, who is the head of the Metropolitan Police Force, who has come out and made the claim that Prince Andrew is not above, as none of us are, above the law. And we put together an article um, about where well, we won't hold our breath, because ultimately, you know, if the Met Police send people around to the residence of Prince Andrew and he comes out with handcuffs on and he's treated like anybody else and he ends up in a cell, then he ends up being questioned by officers, then he ends up being, the files being sent to the CPS, having been charged, and then he ends up in the court, and then he ends up in front of a jury. And then that jury taking on board all the evidence makes a decision completely neutrally as to whether he's guilty or not guilty of the offenses that people say he is. Then, having gone through that process, and hopefully the criminal justice system will treat him like it treats anybody else, then either he'll end up in prison for a considerable amount of time, probably in the United States, or he'll be set free and the things that he's been, he's, he's been um, people are arguing that he's committed, the offences he's committed, um, will be just, were just gossip. But we need a process by which we truly find out. And I suspect that he will become, and I've said this before, that if the criminal justice system doesn't step in, do its job properly, he will eventually become the Jimmy Savile of the royal family. All this stuff will come out, but for those people who are royalists, he'll, he'll be the bad egg, but also he'll be dead. So let's move on. And, and some other people responded, yeah, you, that, will, that may well be the case, but what he will then become is the person, you know, the statue in the middle of the square that all the, all the birds shite on, because it will allow the royal family and the establishment to have a figurehead to completely put everybody off in relation to there being others. So it's a distraction. We know the establishment, we know society, has a considerable, a great number of people who have abused, sexually abused, violently abused people that haven't been held to offence, or have been held to accountability and, and served for that offence. Um, and I think the establishment now are drawing up plans for ensuring that either he gets off or that he becomes the scapegoat. And I think Prince Prince Philip, apparently Prince Philip, Prince Charles has apparently come out this morning and said that from this point on, for the rest of his time, Prince Andrew would no longer take part in any royal duties. Mm. Well, that's an interesting statement, but mm. if it was any, if it was you or me or anybody else out there, and the employer came out and basically said, you know, the punishment's going to be within the family that he's no longer going to be taking part in any public, you know public gatherings or public duties and public responsibilities, we'd be laughing because mm. we'd have got away with it. Yeah. We can't get away with it, and nor can anybody else who's committed these offences. We either have a criminal justice system for all or we don't. But if we don't, they need to hold their hands up and say there are special privileges for certain people. And then we can have a debate and then we can decide what we're going to do next but then we need to have that honest response, not cover-up after cover-up after cover-up. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I agree with all of that, Jason. And, and obviously this has been moved on this, this week because uh, Virginia Guffray, the uh, Amer uh, American young woman, um, or woman in America who, who uh, has claimed that she had sex uh, with, um, with Prince Andrew, uh, many years ago when she was 17, was underage in, in America, um, that she was kind of pressured into that through the, the uh, you know, uh, having been sort of recruited by uh, 
Is a Maxwell. Is Lane Maxwell and uh, you know Jeffrey Epstein, um, and uh, yeah, and that she was sort of uh, introduced to Prince Andrew and then and then sort of uh, coerced into having sex with him. I think on three three occasions. I think she said, um, and she's now uh, possibly because it it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere in terms of the FBI or whoever's investigating it. Uh, don't seem to be moving along very quickly, at least pro probably having barriers when they get to, to um, Buckingham Palace. Um, she's now taking out a private prosecution over the case. So it's interesting, it's interesting. Interestingly, also, Tom, that when he was interviewed in 2019 by Emily Maitlis about this, he said on the first instance, he said he's completely innocent. On the second instance, when they you know, talked about the photographs that he was caught in with his arms around them, slobbering all over them, whatever. He said they'd all been photoshopped. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think that's very likely that they're photoshopped, but still, um, who knows? I mean, the, so the point, I mean, we, we obviously can't be judge and jury, but the point is that due process should be followed as it would be for anybody else. Uh, you know, he should be treated, you know, as Professor Dick, Dick has said, nobody's above the law, that due process should occur in the same way as it would if it was you or I. Um, and, you know, going back to that interview that he did, that car crash of an interview with, with Maitlis on, on the telly, I just want to pick up on three things that he said. So one thing was that he's, he's wanted for questioning by the FBI over it. We've known that for over two years now. Um, and he said in that interview that he was, you know, but perfectly happy to be interviewed, et cetera. But um, as far as uh, to our knowledge, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Why yeah. has that not happened? I mean, we can only imagine that he, his lawyers and Buckingham Palace have, have prevented it from happening. So... It's all very well for him to say, I'm happy to be interviewed by the FBI. So why hasn't he flown out to America to clear his name? If he's not guilty, I'd want to clear my name if it was if it was me. So why hasn't he invited the FBI to come and interview him here or flown to America to be interviewed? He's obviously not made himself available for those interviews. Um, so that was the, the first point from, from the interview. There also is the, the COVID defence, it has to be said at this point as well, that since that point the tumultuous nature of moving in in and out of countries has become a lot more complicated um so he may well use that defense but of course he hasn't got that defense anymore we well, has but it's not it's certainly not as strong as it was over the last 18 months right i mean uh, even that is a, a a little flimsy i'd suggest i mean if it wasn't prince andrew if it were if it were your you or i and we were suspected of of uh uh, the, the kind of offence we're talking about. The F FBI would have come and seen us at some point. There wouldn't be any sort of, oh, COVID, they can't. Um, anyway, the second thing I want to pick up about uh, uh, from what he said in that interview, uh, because Virginia Guffray claimed that uh, she met him at Tramp's nightclub in London. Uh, that's where they were introduced. And that he, um, he was, she remembered them dancing and that he was very sweaty. And he claimed in the interview that he suffers from a quite a rare condition, which means he, he sort of basically doesn't sweat. Um, of course, since the interview, uh, there's been quite a lot of pictures released. Again, he, he no doubt would claim they're photoshopped. There's quite a lot of uh, pictures and bits of film of him sweating like a pig, <laughs> uh, including dancing at nightclubs, you know, uh, all, all over young women and sweating like a pig. So, uh, so not not entirely convincing, uh, based on the evidence. And the last thing is something that I, that astonished me at the time that people didn't really pick up on, um, which is that he made this extraordinary claim in the interview with Maitlis on on telly with Emily Maitlis that that he um, he couldn't have met her on that particular day at Tramp's nightclub because on that particular day he had taken his members of his family, his children, for a, a birthday pizza at Pizza Hut in Croydon or wherever it was in, in, in London, at the Pizza Hut there. Um, extraordinary that, you know, this date was 20 years or so earlier and pretty extraordinary, as people commented afterwards, that he would 
remember that day specifically as the day that, that they went for what he described as an afternoon uh, birthday party at Pizza Hut. And everybody afterwards focused on the ridiculous notion that he would remember that date as, as you know, it well, can't have been because I was at Pizza Hut, as if he would remember that. Um, although, you know, there may be some uh, royal family records of diaries of where they go and things, and it'd be interesting to see if the, you know, the FBI asked for those. Um, but anyway, but, but the point was missed by everyone in focusing on that. He was accused that, you know, she stated that they met at Tramp's nightclub. There's a clue in the name, isn't there? He said, well, I can't have been because I went to an afternoon, he said, in the afternoon, birthday party at Pizza Hut. So in terms of an alibi, even if on the same day he did go to an afternoon party at, at Pizza Hut, it's no alibi for what he did in the evening, which, uh, you know, at night time, he wasn't accused of meeting her at the nightclub in the afternoon. He was accused of meeting her in the nightclub at night time when nightclubs operate on that day. So in terms of offering it as an alibi, it, it just, you know, clearly is, uh, is not an alibi whatsoever. But people seem to have missed that afterwards. I didn't hear anyone talking about that fact. Um, so, yeah, so for me, it was, uh, you know, ridiculous to consider that as an alibi. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Obviously, you know um, the establishment. You can't get more establishment than the royal family, right. and we know that you know the the establishment look after them, look after themselves at, at times of trouble, and um, it benefits the it benefits all for all elements of the establishment, including the rich and privileged people that rule over us in Parliament. Um, it 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 uh, it helps them for the establishment to remain intact. For the royal family, the monarchy to be intact and unquestioned, um, as well as their own privileged backgrounds and uh, you know the the rulers, people like Johnson and as we discussed earlier, Jacob Rees-Mogg, you know these rich, privileged toffs that are born into Im immense wealth, wealth, and then you know go off to eat and then and then they get elected as our MPs without knowing uh, anything much about the lives of ordinary people. Um, all caring. It benefits them all that that establishment remains intact. So uh, I would imagine that Prince Andrew will uh, most likely um, never be interviewed by the FBI, um, possibly never set foot in America again. Um, but I expect, you know, uh, very powerful people, both sides of the Atlantic, have no doubt discussed this. And I suspect that he will never be brought to trial. And to finish yeah, off, and to finish off, you know, an interesting thing trending on Twitter this morning, and and comments that were being made was what Prince Andrew's got to do now is avoid going under a bridge, because generally that's what the people, how the people see these things. You know, we've obviously got Diana, and you've got anybody who's an embarrassment or a threat. Um, since Diana, certainly they, the argument now from the lot of people in the public is, you know. The easiest what thing to do, stick them in a six foot hole, make a big ceremony, change the discourse, change the narrative over time and move on and do exactly the same things as they were doing before. Well, uh, and of course, we should mention Jeffrey Epstein himself, you know, who at once it became yes. very clear and obvious that he had lured a lot of very, very powerful, influential people, including politicians and kings and rulers of countries, into you know a position where they could be blackmailed you know into having sex in, with with children with minors uh etc at sordid sex parties and things that he would hold um and you know abusing children uh he could then extort them extort money and and favors and all sorts from them uh and so when he was arrested obviously before he could reach trial and and uh and the details of of everyone that was involved with him uh, before all the details could come out. Of course, he committed suicide, as they say, in his jail cell. I think the chances that he committed suicide are probably substantially less than 1%. Although, you know, there is that argument, Tom, and really to finish off now. But what does happen, of course, is not just necessarily that they are murdered, which obviously a lot of people suspect, 
But what tends also to happen is that there is a strong recommendation made to them that they take their own life. And the consequences of what of them not taking their life are made very clear to them. Um, but anyway, we have no proof. We only have supposition. Yeah. Um, it's, it just happens to be, you know, what a lot of people are supposing and in the way in which the establishment work and the way in which the so-called police force who are supposed to protect and serve the public, both, you know, obviously in the US and here, but we tend to find that the way in which they protect and serve is quite idiosyncratic, shall we say, when it comes to the, the elites. Okay.